Well, good day. Uh, oh, you know, over the many years I've been a pastor, I've met a lot of people who took their understanding of Christianity uh, from sources or such as the newspapers, maybe books, blogs, magazines, and websites. Whenever there is a report in the news about a prominent Christian who has acted rather badly, uh, or there's been some aspect of a Christian um, being reviewed by the media, often reviled by them, you know, people tend to draw their um, understanding of all things Christian from that particular incident. And some people even go so far as to uh, actually go to their a Bible and then begin to pick out things in it for criticism. There are whole books and websites dedicated to pointing out the problems and the foibles and the inconsistencies of Christians, their Bible, and their faith. Now, as I have engaged in discussions with people as a pastor, as a university and police chaplain, um, I soon discovered that what was quite remarkable and often uh, true about their ridiculous ideas was that they had no clue about what Christianity is really all about. And so I try to explain to them what the gist of Christianity actually is. I usually try uh, doing this by beginning with a conversation, noting that about something about their, um, you know, that they might have been talking about, alluding to in a conversation. Uh, I try to get them to a point where we can cross into some spiritual or moral realm of thinking and tease it out a bit more. And I suggest that there are things that we can talk to people about that we have in common with them. So I might share with them about how my thinking on that particular topic has inf been informed by my Christian world and life view. I might even ask them what their spiritual background is, what their spiritual history is all about. And this is useful information if you're going to ask them later on for permission to uh, talk to them about a, an important question. I usually begin with a question like this. Have you come to uh, a place in your personal life where if you were to die tonight, you know for certain that you have eternal life. Now, most people, uh, you know, will easily answer that question with a, with a yes uh, or a no or an I don't know or some other variant. But, you know, many people are actually quite relieved to know that you can know for certain the answer to that question. The Bible actually tells us about that in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. I write these things to you who believe that you may know that you have eternal life. We might chat about that for a minute, but later on I'm going to ask him another very serious question. Suppose you were to die tonight. I pray that doesn't happen, but hey, things happen. Suppose you were to die tonight and you were to meet God face to face and he asked you, why should I let you into my heaven? What do you suppose you'd say? Now, over the years, I have been genuine, genuinely surprised at the number of people who have never, ever considered that question. And as they try to they fumble and they try to grasp for words, their response usually falls into some basic categories, the largest of which has something to do with how good they've been, how they're trying to be nice. They treat people okay. They go to church. They don't kick the dog. And they even try to keep the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament of the Bible. On that last one, I usually ask, how's that going? before I offer up some really good news to them. So today I want to talk to you about what is the core, the nutshell of Christianity. And so, you know, after we think about asking these two questions, you can begin to tell them about the fact that, you know, heaven is a free gift. Not many people know that. It's a free gift of God 
And the Bible even says so. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is not something that you can earn or be earned. It is definitely not something that any human being has ever deserved. Man's way is to try to earn or deserve or to pay for or to work for everything. And, but God's way is that of grace. To receive freely something that we do not earn or deserve. The best two verses in the Bible about this is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, which say, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. not a result of works, so that no one can boast. If your mom or dad gave you a present at Christmas time because they loved you, and you opened up your wallet and, or your purse to get a fistful of dollars to hand, them, uh, hand it to them as a thank you, would they not be the tiniest bit insulted? Well, of course they would. We don't buy gifts any more than we can buy the gift of heaven that God kindly offers to us. Exactly how much would you actually uh, expect to pay to get your way into heaven? I mean, how good do you think you have to be to get into the kingdom of God? And this can be understood more clearly when we, under, we see what the Bible has to say about mankind in general. And alas, it is not a pretty or altogether kind view. Because the Bible says that each one of us is a sinner. It puts it this way in uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And in this day and age, it's really hard to know what a sin is and what is not. Sin can be defined as uh, a lack of conformity to or transgression of the law of God. Some people think that they're uh, somewhat safe as they don't sin that much at all. Well, that's when I try to tease that out a bit. If you only were to sin, like, say, 10 times a day, okay, for you, we'll do better. We'll make you a saint and say that you only sin three times a day. Well, let's do the math. At 365 days a year, okay, uh, we're talking roughly a thousand sins annually. If we live to the ripe old age of 70 years old, we're talking about 70,000 plus sins in your life going at the cheap rate. I think you would agree. Imagine if you were to come before the local magistrate with 70,000 counts of criminal activity against you, why would a judge do anything but lock you up and throw away the key? You see, the standard that God set is that you and I should not sin at all. And this is a tough ta ask, I think, uh, you know. But that's what God demands. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48 says, You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So the Bible describes sin in various ways. Anything we do that God says not to do is lawlessness. So 1 John 3, 4 says, Everyone who practice, uh, makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Uh, anything that we fail to do that God commands. John uh, James chapter 4, verse 17 says, So whatever, wh whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. We're talking here about evil thoughts. Proverbs 24, 9 says, The devising of folly is sin, and the scoffer is an abomination to mankind. Even the words that we say are problematic. Matthew chapter 12, verse 37 says, For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. The sad part about all of this 
is that given such a perfect standard by God, it's really clear that no individual, past, present, or future, can save himself from the rather, rather catastrophic end, which is damnation. Let me explain. If your mom or your spouse cooks you up a three-egg omelet for breakfast, because you really like omelets, but while breaking the eggs into a bowl found that the last one of the three eggs was putrid, rotten, the smell being overpowering. But because of the cost of eggs these days, she, she throws it in the mix anyway and thinking that perhaps you won't notice it. It's put into a pan and after a certain amount of time it comes out all golden brown and, and looking really great. And, and, and then when it's plated up and served to you, you're really excited. You're hungry. You get a whiff of, of that horribly smelly concoction. Would you take a bite of it? I think not. This illustration is how we must think about our sins before God. We often presume that we can get into heaven um, if we have just done more good deeds than bad than the number of sins we've committed. And so we try to serve up to the Creator the omelet of our lives. All the good things we do with only a few of the really odious sins we have committed. The problem, however, is that since the wages of sin is death, demanded by a God who is perfect, Try as we might, we cannot succeed in saving ourselves. Proverbs 14, verse 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. Do you see now why it's impossible for a person to save themselves? Perhaps this comes into a sharper focus when we look at what the Bible says about God. The Bible describes God as, first of all, a God of love. He is merciful. He's a merciful God who doesn't want to punish us. In fact, the second half of 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 says God is love. This is demonstrated all through the Bible by a heavenly Father who is faithful and loving to his creation his creatures, even humans. But another part of God's character is that he is just and therefore must punish any and all sin, even if you were to commit just one sin your whole life. Well, Exodus chapter uh, four, 34, verses 6 and 7 says, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and children and the children's children to the third and fourth generations. In other words, he will not by any means pardon the guilty. So think about it this way. You, you, you are arrested for a bank robbery, and you, you appear before the magistrate, and upon conviction, he passes down a sentence of life imprisonment for your offense. As they are about to take you away, your, your father jumps up from the gallery and shouts to the judge to take him instead of you, and the magistrate says, well, I don't care who does the time for the crime as long as somebody pays. And so the magistrate says, you know, yeah, come on down, you can do it. But then just about as your uh, dad is being handcuffed and led away, the magistrate looks at his paperwork and says, hey, hold on, hold on. Um, it says here that you are also guilty of bank robbery. You have to serve your own time, dad. Well, your mom jumps up then and says that she will do the time for you. But the magistrate looks at his work, his paperwork, and sees that she is also a convicted 
bank robber who must serve her own time. And in fact, it's a, a similar situation for all your brothers and sisters and any who want to volunteer to do your time. Yet all of them have to do their own time for their own crimes. This is this, of course, is leaving you left to do the time for your crimes. God must punish those who are guilty. And no one can escape the problem because only God is holy and can never be in the presence of sin. Ever, ever, ever. In the end, this dilemma leaves the entire human race in rather dire straits. But the good news is that God has solved this problem in the person of Jesus Christ. So let's talk about that for a minute. You know, you should know two things about the one they call Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The first one, the first thing that you need to know is that uh, who is just Jesus? Well, he is both divine and human at the same time. According to the Bible, uh, Jesus Christ is God, the second person of the Trinity, and the creator of the universe. God came down into human flesh. He is the infinite God-man who came to earth and was born of the Virgin Mary. And so the Bible confirms uh, this this way in 1 John chapter, uh, chapter 1, I'm sorry, uh, John chapter 1, verse 1 and then verse 14 it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, glory uh, as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then in John chapter 20, verse 28, you have the uh, uh, Apostle Thomas answering Jesus who he doubted at first was actually alive and he told him to put you know his fingers into his uh, wounds and his side and then Thomas answers him my Lord and my God so that's who Jesus is the second thing you need to know about him is what is it he did what did he come to the earth to do well he came and he died out a horrible, terrible, awful death on the cross in order to pay the penalty for our sins. And after that, he then rose from the dead three days later in order to purchase a place in heaven for us, uh, which he then offers to us as a free gift. Most people know that Jesus died on a cross, but I don't think that they understand the significance of it, what it actually accomplished. If we were to take all of those 70,000 plus sins from your life and put them into a book called the, the Record Book of Life, well, if that records your all your 70,000 sins, it would be a, a very thick book. I don't have a really thick book here by my side. Maybe I do. Uh, well, let's just... Let's just take this thick book here. All right. Let's just let this represent, okay, the sins of your life. All right. And in my left hand, you can see that it's sitting on top of it. And let my right hand represent, you know, uh, you know, the God that is in heaven. And this book is getting in the way of your left hand getting to your right hand. You get the picture here a bit? So that there's no way that you can get from one place to the other, and certainly not on your own. However, and this is the best part, Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet, put it this way, in chapter 53, verse 6, We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. So now you imagine that your right hand, which represents God, takes the record book of your sins and puts it on himself. Just 
like God with your sins. He puts them on his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Jesus was on that cross, he did what no other human being could do. Pay for the sins of the world. And as he breathed his very last breath, he uttered a very interesting Greek word, tetelestai, which when it's translated is kind of a, what they would call a, a financial term, meaning the debt has been paid. Literally, it is finished. So this illustrates that all my sin, which God hates, has been placed on Christ when he died in my place on the cross. And when Jesus died, he purchased for us a place in heaven. But I want you to know that you had nothing to do with it. It was all God, all Jesus, and his finished work. There's another word that we use in this circumstance. It's called grace. Grace representing God's unmerited favor. Or even God's riches at Christ's expense. A, a little acronym you can think about. Something to get us, that something we get when we don't deserve it. That's what grace is. And we get this grace when we believe by faith. Now, a lot of people say that they believe in God. They have a faith that something exists out there that we may or may not call God, but they think it is God. And people have a lot of weird ideas about what faith is and what it's not. Faith is a lot like a set of keys. Um, I don't have a set of keys here right now. I should have brought a set in here. But I have a lot of keys on my key ring, you know what I mean? And when I look at my keys, I know one thing is true. There's only one key that's going to open my front door. You can try all the other keys on that key ring, but you're, none of them are going to work except that one key. Um, faith is the key that opens the door of heaven. And it's the only key that's going to work. To appreciate this, we need to understand what faith is not. What faith in Jesus is not. Uh, sometimes we call it mere intellectual assent. And that's not what we're talking about. The word mere intellectual assent is important because it does indicate that we do need to assent intellectually to the facts of the gospel. But that, in and of itself, is not enough. In other words, it's not just tipping your hat to God, uh, just knowing lots of facts and stuff about God. Perhaps one of the greatest scholars and theologians um, of the Christian faith is someone who most certainly does not believe any of it. We're talking here about the devil himself. Satan knows a lot about God, but has no faith in God, Has does not have a faith that leads to eternal life. In fact, the Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 19, you believe that God is one. You do well. Hey, even the demons believe that and shudder. Matthew chapter 8, verse 29 says, And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O son of man? Have you come here to torment us before the time? We're talking about demons speaking to Jesus here. They knew who the Christ was. Let me tell you what else isn't true faith. We're talking here about... Uh, something that might be related to a moment in time or uh, something that is temporal, a temporal faith. And by that, I mean that we are trusting God in a temporary crisis in this life. It might be that you're sick, you're going to have surgery, and so you pray a prayer asking God to heal you. You might have money problems, so you have a financial faith that you know God's going to see you through. You might be flying or there'll be driving dangers. And so you ask the Lord for uh, traveling mercies and safety. 
and you 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 pray for faith with faith you you have big decisions to make in your life and so you ask god for wisdom and you in faith pray a prayer like that these are not wrong but they have one thing in common they're temporal this kind of faith is good but it's not a faith that can save you I knew men who were soldiers who in battle would pray hard that in their foxholes that God would protect them. And God may have saved them from dying that day, but it is not a faith that's going to lead them to eternal life. What faith is, is trusting in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. This means that you don't rely on being good or being kind or being obedient to get yourself into heaven. But it means that you simply trust that Jesus' sacrifice for you is enough to get you there. Nothing needs to be added to that. All it requires is that you believe in faith. And there are three parts to this faith. It, it, the first part being knowledge, an intellectual element. You need to know what it is you're believing in. It's assenting and agreeing with the facts. You are a sinner. I am a sinner. And that all is not right. We're going to hell in a handbasket if something doesn't happen here. And so then... Our faith has, is completed by knowledge, assent, and trust, relying and depending not upon us, but on the finished work of Jesus Christ. The Bible puts it very simply in Acts chapter 16, verse 31. And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. There's an amazing story of a guy named Charles Blondin a famous French tightrope walker. And uh, there's in this, this illustration, you have uh, Blondin in 14 September, 1860, uh, coming to the Niagara Falls in New York State, or whatever state that is. I'm not sure where Niagara, what state Niagara Falls is in. But anyway, there were people from both Canada and America coming from miles and miles around to see this guy walk walk a tightrope that was stretched over 11,000 feet, a quarter of a mile, uh, over, the, over Niagara Falls. And he walked across 160 feet above the falls several times, each time with a different daring feat, one with a sack, uh, one on stilts, one on a bicycle, another in the dark, and blindfold even. And one time he even carried a stove, and cooked an omelet in the middle of the road. So this large crowd uh, gathers, and the buzz of excitement ran along both sides of the riverbank, and the crowd oohed and awed as blonde and carefully walked across one dangerous step after another, pushing a wheelbarrow, holding a sack of potatoes. At one point, he asked for the participation of a volunteer. Upon reaching the other side, the crowd's up applause was louder and the roar of the falls and he stopped and he addressed his audience do you believe that i can carry a person across in this wheelbarrow and of course the crowd enthusiastically yelled yes you are the greatest type walker in the world we believe and he said okay who's going to get into the wheelbarrow and as far as we know concerning this story no one did at that time this unique story illustrates a real-life picture of what faith really is. The crowd watched the daring feats. They said they believed, but their actions proved that they truly did not believe. Similarly, it is one thing for us to believe in God. However, it is a more true faith when we believe in God and put our faith and trust in His Son, Jesus Christ, alone. Let me push the point just a tad bit further. I have a chair in my office. It's right over there. Um, I believe that 
the chair actually exists. I believe that the chair will actually hold me up if I sit in it. But what would I have to do to prove to you, to you, that the chair would actually hold me up? Now, I can only presume that you would demand that I sit in the chair in the same way that Charles Blondin demanded that one of them sit in his wheelbarrow. You see, God demands our faith in him that we sit in the chair that is Jesus Christ and trust him to hold us up and to save us. There was a time when I uh, myself trusted my, myself to get myself into heaven. I thought that if I did enough good things, I could get there. But then I came to understand that I needed to transfer my trust to Christ alone and all that he did on the cross for me. So the bottom line is that salvation, all of it, belongs to the Lord our God as, a, as a, the author and finisher of our faith. You don't have anything to contribute or offer concerning your salvation. You might ask, well, what are we supposed to do after we believe by faith? Well, that too is an answer that's given to us in Scripture, following on from two other verses that we read earlier in Ephesians chapter 2. Let's now look at uh, 8, 9, and 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, we do good works not to get saved, but because we are saved by faith. We do not live the rest of our lives just moping about. We, we live our lives with an attitude of gratitude. One person put it this way, uh, faith is the hand of of uh, a beggar reaching out to receive a gift. All right? The king passes by, and he reaches down to the beggar, and he hands him a gift, which is then taken by the beggar and received in faith. That gift to you is eternal life in Christ Jesus. It is a gift that is received by a proper faith. I hope some of this makes sense to you. If it does, then you have questions that you might want answered, like questions that I might ask you, actually. Is there anything that's going to stop you from receiving the gift of eternal life right now? Because when we're what we're talking about here is a transfer of trust from saving yourself to letting Jesus save you. It's that whole chair thing. It's receiving the resurrected and living Christ, actually agreeing that Jesus entered into space, time, and history to accomplish salvation for his people. It's receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior, there's a great verse in Revelation chapter 3, 20. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. We're talking here about receiving Christ Jesus as Lord. And this is kind of where the rubber meets the road. You are no longer your own. Jesus owns you. He's the Lord of all your life now. Your thoughts, your actions, your uh, your whole being. And that takes us down and drills down to what has to happen next. Where you get yourself alone with God and you repent of your sins. This is something that every Christian has to do regularly, not just once, but daily before the Lord. We have to be holy like the Lord our God. 
And so you confess your sins to God that they may be forgiven in Christ. And you start each day new and holy. What is the result of our faith, you may ask? Well, you know, there's some really great benefits to giving of your life to God and having God give you that gift of faith. You get eternal life with Jesus in heaven. That's pretty good. It's kind of nice knowing that, you know, where you're going when you die. You can be even certain about it. John chapter 6, verse 47 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. But secondly, you also get to be a part of the family of God. You have now become a, a, a son and daughter of God. You know, you have millions of other believers called saints who now are your brothers, your new brothers and sisters in Christ. You will find them in local churches. And they would just absolutely love to hear about your newfound faith. So, hey, welcome. But you also get another thing that's really cool, and that's the Holy Spirit of God who comes and takes up residence in your life. And with God now living inside of you and guiding your conscience daily, he will begin a really great transformation in you that will change you into becoming more and more like Jesus. Becoming like Jesus is the goal of every Christian. Well, what's next, you might ask? Well, there probably are some things that you should try uh, to do in order to kind of kickstart your new faith in Jesus. You can begin, first of all, by reading your Bible. Try starting out with a New Testament book, maybe the, the Gospel of John, and you'll find that in the contents uh, page of any Bible. And just read. Read the Bible. Read a few verses every day. Maybe read a chapter a day. The Bible is your handbook of faith. It will teach you all you need to know about God. Secondly, you need to talk to God in prayer. You want, might want to begin by acknowledging God as creator. And then thank him for the salvation and faith that you have now received in Jesus. You, you should then confess your sins to God, as I said before earlier. God is anxious to hear from you on that score. And you, then you can bring in some of your concerns and your requests to God because he delights in giving his children good gifts. And remember to close your prayers in the name of Jesus because that's what Jesus said to do. Worshiping God is one of the great things that all Christians get to do. We can do it privately each day, but we can also take the opportunity to meet with others on the Lord's Day, what we call Sunday, to gather together with other Christians, praise God with singing and prayer and listening to the preached Word of God delivered by a minister. This is the kind of stuff that's going to edify you and will grow you in your knowledge of God. Simply being around other Christians is also a great way to grow and develop. So meeting up with other people, uh, we call that fellowship, um, that's going to give you some examples about how to uh, live a godly life as you look at other people and what they're doing. You can meet other people for meals and Bible studies and serving and helping the poor, um, loving each other in the name of Jesus. Lastly, you need to be able to think about sharing your newfound faith with other people. Uh, as Jesus becomes a reality in your life, it's good to share what has happened to you by telling your family, your friends, and your colleagues. You, you are God's instrument here in spreading the good news of faith to other people in Jesus. And there are plenty of other people who out in the world who need to hear where they are going when they die. And so you need to tell them about Jesus. If you would like to tell me that you have become a Christian, I would love to hear about that. You might have some questions that I can answer for you. In any case, 
send me a, a private message and I'll do my best to get back to you. I hope that you've enjoyed this Christianity in a nutshell and that it made sense for you and that God would bless you as you think about it, pray about it, and commit your life to him. I'm Scott Krieger, and this is my moment in the sun.